Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. This is uh, Michael Herman, uh, and I'm uh, just finished presenting uh, the Web 7.0 DIDCOM Architecture Reference Model Presentation Part 2 uh, to the, the DIF uh, DIDCOM user group, and uh, thought this would be a good time to record um, uh, a fresh copy, uh, given that we were uh, interrupted partway through. Um, the other new thing since last time is uh, Web 7.0 has a mascot, Meet Freddy. Freddy has a Twitter uh, handle, uh, at Freddy Architect, and Freddy's available to answer any questions um, just by uh, sending a, either a direct message or posting a tweet um, to, uh, to at Freddy Architect. And Freddy will be available on each of the question pages as we go through uh, as we go. I start off the presentation just recapping a few of the questions from the previous presentation. Uh, let me go through those and then when we come back to the title slide, we'll start into part two uh, in earnest. So um, Brian Richer had, had mentioned, uh, you know, did peer and that it's a did method that doesn't require a did registry and a traditional did document that it's all uh, encoded uh, within the the did uh, itself, and and that was um, that was a good piece of education. He he, he continued to elaborate on that in the didcom uh, Discord group, um, and so as a response to that, uh, there's a new Appendix C uh, going into the Web 7.0 uh, didcom ARM white paper uh, that recaps uh, Bryant's discussion. And then in the architecture, uh, because Web 7.0 is in based entirely on DIDCOM agents, the DIDCOM registry is not exposed using the traditional uh, DID resolution protocol. It's actually exposed by a DIDCOM agent, the DID registry gateway. And so that you make inquiries um, by passing in, you know, DIDCOM messages. And that DIDCOM registry gateway, if required then, will uh, query the DIDCOM registry using one of the DID um, resolution protocols to do that. But uh, the point I'm, I want to make here is the way that DID peer is supported is you still make an inquiry as if you were expecting a DID document from the DID registry, uh, but it's going to be one that's essentially calculated uh, within the registry gateway uh, from did from the did colon peer uh, did and uh, and it'll be returned as a did document so that we'll have transparent or uh, symmetric access to all did methods uh, via the did registry gateway. Uh, the second point that was brought up was why are you only talking about verifiable credentials? There's lots of conversations, for example, going on about didcom messages and MDLs, the driver's license specification, which is not based on uh, verifiable credentials. So that was a great comment as well. So in the didcom notation, I've subsequently as examples, 24 additional uh, DIDCOM message attachments uh, elements. PDF files, X509 certificates, MDLs, uh, shopping cards, uh, music, uh, NFTs, uh, cryptocurrency tokens, um, office documents, zip files, um, web pages, you name it. And just a side note that was brought up today is some of these very large attachments should be stored, you know, on cloud storage, for example, IPFS, and uh, represented as a, a linked attachment in the didcom message, uh, which was a Thank you for that. Um, the third point that came up last time was, can I elaborate a little bit more on the disconnected uh, didcom agent scenario? Specifically, there's two sub scenarios one is when the uh, receiving didcom agent is not online how do you handle that or if they're sitting behind a firewall uh, and so the didcom client or the the sending agent cannot uh, you know simply do a, 
a REST call uh, in the HTTP network cannot do a REST call uh, to that receiving agent. So how do you handle that? Um, I created this simplified uh, layer four network uh, model, the DIDCOM agent mesh network model, where there's only a single relay or moderator mediator node. And so the client there, the DIDCOM client, who's trying to send a message uh, to the DIDCOM agent, if that DIDCOM agent is not online, uh, what the client will do is then send that uh, authenticated encrypted uh, DIDCOM message. It'll uh, forward it as a forward message uh, to, the, to the mediator, to the router node, where it'll be cached, uh, securely cached, because again, it's encrypted to only be read by the receiver. Um, and then when the DIDCOM agent on the left comes online, the first thing that it will do is uh, query that <coughs> local or the nearest um, rotor node, mediator node to, to download that message. And so that's how we handle the disconnected agent scenario. This also represents this diagram, the minimum viable network model. So if, uh, represents what uh, a minimum uh, network would look like for a developer scenario. Uh, point number four is amalgamation of a couple things. What's Web 7's relationship to Web 5? Does Web 7 play well with Daniel's grand uh, unity uh, theorem? And uh, how, how about other DIDCOM messaging transports besides HTTP? How does, how does that work? Is that included in, in Web 7.0? Um, how is a DIDCOM user agent different from a DIDCOM agent? Um, so Web 7 is completely different from Web 5, and I have a slide or two about that. Uh, they're both prime numbers. That's the only thing they share in common. Uh, Web 7.0 loves the global uh, unity theorem. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more about that. Um, so Web 7.0 is a completely new ecosystem running on top of the internet. Well, Web 5 to me appears to be additive to you know Web 2 and Web 3. Let's have examples there. So you know what is Web 7.0? Web 7.0 is a unified software and hardware ecosystem for building resilient, trusted, decentralized systems using decentralized identifiers, DIDCOM agents, and verifiable credentials. And the tagline there is take what you need and leave the rest. We'll talk a little bit about that, a little bit about that later. And uh, it does play in that, that tagline, take what you need, leave the rest, uh, actually uh, ties in quite well with the, <clears throat> uh, the grand unity theorem in that uh, in two ways, two subtle ways. One is um, take what web 7.0 needs from existing specification efforts and leave the rest. For example, Web 7.0 has nothing to do with wallets and APIs. We, we feel they're unnecessary when you're dealing with a pure agent-based model. So we take what we need from the W3C CCG uh, working groups, from the DIFF working groups, from the TOIP working groups, from the Hyperledger uh, working groups, uh, we take what's necessary to make a, a, a cohesive, unified platform, and we leave the rest. The other way that you can look at um, Web 7.0, take what you need, leave the rest, is from a consumption perspective. You don't need to use all of Web 7.0. You use what you need, and, and you leave the rest. You use what you need to build resilient, trustable, decentralized systems and leave the rest. So, for example, you can use MDLs and maybe not uh, verifiable credentials. It's up to you. We like to play well with the gut. This is the topmost or layer six of the uh, DIDCOM architecture reference model, the realization of Web 7.0. The things to note are that we have DIDCOM agents here in the, in the middle. We can either do point-to-point -point communications or we can route <clears throat> DIDCOM messages through a DIDCOM network. The transports can be HTTP or whatever you want, Bluetooth, gRPC, WebSockets. 
There's a special kind of DIDCOM agent called a DIDCOM user agent that is paired with a traditional DIDCOM agent. And the DIDCOM user agent is what exposes a user interface. It's the way that humans interact with a DIDCOM network. How does Web7 um, compare or uh, relate to the Web5 um, decentralized web platform? Well, on the right is the traditional diagram, uh, the TBD um, model for where DIDs, DWNs, distributed web applications, etc., fit in uh, to the decentralized web platform. And if I lay in uh, the Web 7.0 sort of three-tiered model, kind of side by side, you get a sense for, for how they relate. So the virtual web drives at the bottom, those could be DWNs, they could be solid pods, they could be Trinity graphs. In the middle tier, we've got the DIDCOM agents, uh, including the DIDCOM always on agent. Um, and then those agents are paired often with a DIDCOM user agent, which exposes a user interface. So we have the, the DIDCOM user, ed, uh, user agent using DIDCOM protocols to query or, or receive, to query or send information to the DIDCOM agent it's paired with, and then uh, the DIDCOM agent that it's paired with can send information, uh, refresh results back into the user agent, you know, as required. Um, so th th those are kind of obvious and they seem kind of similar where they really differ. And we discussed this uh, this past week in the, uh, in the DWN secure data storage uh, working group, diff working group. And <clears throat> They really differ in uh, where the protocols, what layer the protocols are situated in the respective stacks. So in the case of DWNs, the DWN storage protocol is at the storage layer. It's at the bottom of the stack. It's in the third tier. Uh, in Web7, the DIDCOM messaging protocol is in the middle tier. It's for connecting agents in the middle tier agent to agent to agent. The other uh, big difference is <clears throat> where does the, the logic live? Uh, so in the Web 7.0 model, there's a BPMN workflow engine that is part of the DIDCOM agent. And it uh, when um, DIDCOM messages with or without attachments, a DIDCOM message with a an invoice or a purchase order or a driver's license or whatever, when it's received by the agent, it can be processed directly by a workflow engine. <clears throat> and then optionally, it can be saved down into the web drive. Um, there really is no counterpart um, in the, um, the you know, TBD Web 5 model. Um, Messages come into DWNs. DWNs can synchronize content across DWNs. DWNs can raise events, but there's no specific component of the architecture uh, other than saying that there's this thing called a DWA where, where business logic actually lives. Another visualization of the difference between DIDCOM agents and, and DWNs, which are kind of like wallets on steroids, uh, is represented here by the Keurig coffee maker and a coffee cup. So on the left, the Keurig coffee maker uh, can process authenticated encrypted uh, message inputs, uh, produce authenticated encrypted message outputs, and in the middle, those um, inputs and outputs can be processed uh, via a workflow. And so we think the, uh, the Keurig coffee maker is a, a great example of a DIDCOM agent. Um, a DWN on, on the other side is a, a, a great way uh, for storing stuff. It has very strong schematized storage with very strong authorization and access controls. Uh, a DWN, a coffee mug, plays very well with a coffee maker in the sense that a DIDCOM agent can make use of a DWN for storage. Uh, but we believe that fundamentally uh, life is about uh, connecting processes, active processors together 
uh, that are capable of processing DIDCOM messages and optionally processing through the, the Web 7.0 workflow engine. Over here uh, on the DWN side, uh, the storage protocol is at the storage level. It's at the third tier in a traditional three tier architecture. So although it's a powerful capable protocol, it's really about, it's really about data, the storage of data and the replication of data. Uh, the other follow-up from the previous uh, presentation, more of an addition than a response to a specific question, is uh, the addition of the Web 7.0 Always On DIDCOM Agent. This is a DIDCOM Agent appliance, a piece of hardware that runs the DIDCOM Agent code, and it's paired with the trusted personal agent running on your phone. The trusted personal agent is a DIDCOM agent. But just like you can't expect to represent your entire life in the storage on your phone, or a, a large company like Microsoft, Google, or Apple to represent everything that they do in their company on a phone, you need this auxiliary appliance. You need this device that lives in your home, maybe in a safe or a vault, that is a DIDCOM agent that could be paired with a, dr a trusted uh, personal agent. That trusted personal agent, more likely than not, is what we call the DIDCOM user agent. It's the user interfaces, uh, the apps, the super app uh, that talks to uh, your always on DIDCOM agent uh, back at home or at work or wherever they might be. So that's the introduction. Those are the follow ups from last time. So let's start in earnest now. We're about uh, 16, 17 minutes into the talk. So who am I? My name is Michael Herman. I live on a cattle ranch in uh, southeastern Alberta, about four hours north of Haver, Montana, if you know where Haver is, about three hours straight east of Calgary, Alberta. Um, those are actually some of my cows. Um, I have the luxury of living in one of the most beautiful parts of Canada. This is what my picture window uh, next to my office looks like uh, as I'm working on this presentation, as I'm making these recordings. This is what I, uh, I have to inspire me. Um, as I mentioned in the first part of the talk, I just want to highlight that um, I'm not only a believer in first principles thinking, I am a first principles thinker. and that is just my nature to take things and break them down, deconstruct them into their most, most basic elements, and then reassemble them from the ground up. Uh, I, I do this with everything I encounter, uh, so I'm not really apologetic about it. And you'll see uh, instance, a reason why I mention this is you'll see instances of this where um, I'll be combining um, technologies and artifacts from across the different uh, you know, decentralized communities some I'll use, some I won't use. Sometimes I'll recast things a little bit different um, in, uh, in terms of putting the whole uh, DIDCOM architecture reference model together and explaining it to you and, and, and how that actually becomes the full realization of, of Web 7.0. I've already kind of introduced Freddie, Freddie Architect. Uh, Freddie's the mascot for uh, Web 7.0 and the DIDCOM architecture reference model. Uh, again, if you have any questions, just feel free to post, uh, post those against at Freddie on Twitter. I'd also like to acknowledge the grand unifying theory uh, of trust um, and for Daniel Hardman and the Decentralized Identity Foundation uh, for you know, inaugurating that or incubating that uh, at uh, last week. Uh, a little bit of fun with that. Um, I did a little Googling, and there's something called the Great Unity Church. And um, I found it on Wikipedia. It has some interesting words like, people disliked seeing resources being wasted and did not seek to possess them. They wanted to exert their strength, but did not do it for their own benefit. Um, I don't know if Pastor Daniel Hardman was reading these words when he came up with the idea, but uh, if you want to have a little fun with the uh, grand uh, unifying theorem 
uh, we all can become members of the Great Unity Church. And it's a bit of a test. Are you willing to give up some of your sacred cows, your sacred gods, your sacred artifacts to become a member of the Great Unity Church? I'll leave that for you to decide. Okay, back to something more uh, tangible. The, this presentation is part two of an explanation of the DIDCOM agent architecture reference model. And uh, it is based on uh, the DIDCOM architecture reference model white paper. This white paper was completed uh, in late November, early December. It's a design guide for software architects trying to build uh, decentralized, trusted, resilient, decentralized applications using uh, decentralized identifiers, uh, DIDCOM agents, and, uh, and verifiable credentials. The goals of the white paper were to better understand the active components of a DIDCOM agent-based software system and how these components rely and interact with each other, introduce a new graphical modeling language called DIDCOM to aid architects and developers in visualizing new architectures and designs, and to describe a layered architecture reference model, the DIDCOM ARM, to help guide the design and creation of the broadest range of DIDCOM agents-based software systems possible. So in this uh, particular part two presentation are mostly focused on doing a deep dive into the six layers. Uh, if you look at the part one uh, presentation, it's part of this YouTube playlist uh, that will help you with the uh, understanding the DIDCOM notation, as well as some of the motivations, um, some of the motivations for the DIDCOM architecture reference model. It also gives you an overview of the uh, first five layers, four or five layers of the model. Uh, this will give you a deep dive into all seven. Um, just a little note here about intellectual property rights. Uh, so the white paper itself is copyright using the uh, Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike um, International Public License. There's specific clauses in the attribute share like version of the Creative Commons license that uh, ensures that any derivative works or derivative works of derivative works or derivative works of derivative works of derivative works uh, contain attribution back to the original author. That's just something that's important to me. Um, there are some trademarks, some dry, trademarks of some graphical logos, Web 7.0 graphical logos. We're not trademarking or trying to protect the phrase Web 7.0 in any way. We're not trying to make the mistake that the, the Web 5 uh, folks embarked on. Um, but as we create sort of official products, um, training products, content, um, recordings, um, they may carry one of these graphical trademarks. This white paper is neither a W3C, DIFF, Sovereign Foundation, Hyperledger, or TWIPE uh, publication, uh, unofficial, official, or otherwise. It's an independent product uh, of the author. Okay, so what is Web 7.0? So across the top, uh, the first the left and center diagrams there uh, at the top, those come from a computer history museum, a graphic which was explaining the difference between the internet and the web. The internet is for connecting devices using a global communications network. What we know of is, is you know, primarily based on TCP IP, UDP, and those kinds of protocols. Web 7.0, or Web 2.0 and 3.0 is an application, a client server application built on top of the internet. And it's for connecting people to centralized websites and email servers. Web 7.0 is vastly different from Web 2 and Web 3. It is based on top of the internet. It, like Web 2 and Web 3, it's an application that runs on top of the internet. You can put your left hand on top of your right hand. That left hand would be Web 7.0 and your right hand is the internet. 
And it's about connecting individuals to each other. It's not about connecting people to centralized websites. It's about connecting individuals to each other via their trusted personal agents. So in the fullness of time, everybody will have at least one trusted personal agent. Every company will have one or more trusted personal agents. There will be no websites. There are no websites in Web 7.0. There are only agents that are interconnected using the DIDCOM protocol. So if we drop down into the green boxes, just to highlight that on the left, we see in the Web 2, Web 3 world, uh, we have building blocks like web browsers and web servers, HTTP, we have web pages and we have data um, in, that, in that world where we're connecting people to centralized websites. Web 7.0 is about the DIDCOM protocol didcom agents, didcom messages, with attach, potentially with attachments like verifiable credentials. We have decentralized identifiers and the way that we connect all this stuff up is using the did registry. We take a decentralized identifier and use that, you know, to find the URLs of the agents and, and, and that all works together as its own separate system, side by side, but completely separate and distinct from web two. And web 3. Of course, all of that runs on top of the devices we have, whether it be our smartphones, our personal computers, uh, our, la our, our, uh, our tablets, big servers, IoT devices, and then of course that runs on top of the internet, the global communications network. So with that as a little bit of a, uh, an introduction, let's talk about the DIDCOM agent architecture reference model itself. So if we look at the DIDCOM white paper, ARM white paper, it really has four parts represented in black here. And we have created two presentations, two um, video tutorials to, to explain the DIDCOM architecture reference model as described in the white paper. So part one of the tutorials uh, describes the DIDCOM, mutation, DIDCOM notation and an overview of the first five layers. Um, this uh, video tutorial is going to do an, a deep dive into all seven layers of uh, the DIDCOM ARM and hence be a full explanation of what Web 7.0 is. We also talk about some future uh, directions and conclusions at the end of this talk. So stay there till the end. And there's Freddie if you have any questions. If you have any questions while you're watching this on YouTube, uh, just go to Twitter and uh, send a tweet to at Freddie Architect and Freddie will answer those questions for you. Okay, we're going to drill down into the layers of the model. So we're going to start by looking at the core layers, layers 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then we'll look at layers 4, 5, and 6 uh, after. So layer 0. Again, if you go back to what is the, the raison d'etre for this white paper, it's to help software architects and software developers better understand uh, DIDCOM, DIDCOM communications. I think of DIDCOM communications as being, you know, the DIDCOM, you know, messaging protocol, DIDCOM agents, DIDCOM message attachments um, as being sort of the three primary, you know, constituents. So where do we start? Uh, whenever I do a presentation or a white paper, I think of it as trying to give people a bus tour. And if you want to have a successful bus tour, what's the most important thing? That everybody gets on the same bus. And so layer zero is an attempt to get everybody on the same bus. Everybody, every software developer and architect probably has or should have some familiarity with the rest over HTTP uh, model for, for you know, agents trying to communicate with each other. So here's an example on the right is a REST over HTTP agent trying to communicate or send a simple plain text message, this timestamp to a REST over HTTP agent. So that client um, needs to, to do something to get that message to shoot across. So if we're assuming, an assumption we're making is we're, we are using HTTP, the HTTP protocol. And so there's a, an HTTP verb called put. 
And so we need to format uh, uh, an HTT message, some headers and what have you, and, uh, and attach that, that message uh, to those headers. And uh, we need to send that across. So to, for, for the client on the right to send it to the agent on the left, we need to know uh, the agent's address. We need to know the URL, either the domain name and port, like example.com colon 8080, or we need to know the numerical uh, IP address. Ultimately, we need to know the numerical IP address. And, and if we don't, if we just use the domain name, like example.com, uh, the URL uh, colon 8080, we will use services like uh, the local hosts file, uh, or DNS, a DNS a server to map, uh, you know, example.com into its real life IP address, 93.184.216.34. Um, but once we have that numerical IP address, then uh, the client on the right can open, a, create an instance of an HTTP client, and it can do an HTTP put to send that message across. On the agent side, we have an HTTP handler, which will receive that HTTP request and um, unpack it uh, and eventually get that timestamp message. So that's how layer zero works of the DIDCOM architecture reference model. It's all about the model, the architecture reference model is all about starting somewhere simple and in tiny, tiny baby steps leading you through to a full and deep understanding of how DIDCOM works. DIDCOM is simple. The baby steps have to be really, really simple. So the next slide here, you know, if you, you have, you know, in all of these levels, we talk a lot about service endpoint resolution. So in this case, we need the, the protocol, HTTP. We need the address, the port, the path. That's generally encoded like into a URL. And then we either have to resolve the domain name using a local host file or using a DNS server resolution. But once we have the numerical IP address and the port, it's straightforward. Um, just to get an idea of how the white paper explains this for each of the layers, for each of the drill down or deep dives into each of the layers, uh, it's structured basically like this. There's a small, simple diagram that illustrates the scenario or the model. A more detailed diagram where we're annotating it with um, in this case, URLs and addresses and stuff, and in other models, we'll be adding uh, decentralized identifier names and 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 that sort of thing. And then from those diagrams, we add uh, some narrative to explain what's happening or what needs to happen. And finally, we we deal detail that into a set of specific steps or what we call a model workflow that explains, you know, what you have to do to send a message from a rest over HTTP client to rest over HTTP agent. Um, I'm only going to show this for layer zero as we go through layer one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, these explanations uh, get more elaborate and cover several pages. And I refer you to the white paper for that. Um, in each layer, I do a little sidebar to int introduce another, some other aspect of Web 7.0. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about Web 7.0 versions and distributions. So a version defines a set of capabilities that are available in all implementations of a specific version. So pick a, pick a version Web 7.0. Um, the Web 7.0 version uh, will be a, a specification. It's the 7.0 is an example of the version identifier for the for the first web 7.0 specification. The next one will be 7.1, 7.2. So version numbers define different levels or versions of the specification. A distribution is a particular implementation of a particular version uh, of web 7. whatever. So the following are some examples of distribution names. So there's Seven, the 7.0 reference distribution, uh, the 7.0 Hyperledger Indie distribution. There might be the uh, 7.0 Akapai distribution or whatever the case might be. So versions refer to versions of the spec. Distributions refer to specific implementations of, of a particular spec. Uh, and the distribution concept comes from the Linux operator.
the way that we visualize um, the reference specifications and distributions is using this uh, eight axis model. Uh, we'll be in trouble as soon as we find a ninth axis, but this is serving us well so far. Uh, here, let me show the more detailed version of this. So uh, as an example of the reference distribution, the reference implementation for, web, for the Web 7.0 um, reference uh, specifications, so the reference distribution for the reference specification, um, I just happen to be more comfortable with C sharp and uh, what I call the uh, DIDCOM super stack um, tool set. Um, and so here you'll see that uh, the foundation distribution will be based on HTTP. It's going to use the Visual Studio uh, tools. Uh, it's going to use C sharp. It's going to use the Trinsic um, Okapi. Uh, libraries for C Sharp for doing all the DIDCOM uh, heavy lifting. It's going to use the new DID server uh, to represent the DID registry. It's going to use the DID over DNS protocol. And uh, that DID over DNS protocol is going to be fronted with a DID registry gateway. A DID registry gateway is a DIDCOM agent. Um, and uh, so I think I think they've described that enough. Cool things about the Foundation distribution uh, is its use of the DIDCOM super stack that I mentioned and automatic code generation. So here's an example of what's called the Trinity specification language. And this is a complete specification of the layer zero rest over HTTP server. So in the bottom here, lines 20 through 23, um, we can see that there's a server uh, called layer zero agent server. Um, and it supports one protocol called send message. So this is the definition of the service endpoint. And that service endpoint is an HTTP endpoint. It understands a send message request and it doesn't uh, produce a response. If we go up here and look at what a send message request is, mm -hmm. it's simply a text message. So we're pretty good on, on that score. completely separate from the previous example in the green box is this example in the blue box. And this is how you'd specify a DID document, all the components of a DID document. And if you look at these particular URLs in the DID core specification, you'll find that a DID document has an ID. It has a context. It has an also known as, and it has a controller. These are all defined as lists of strings. They'll have verification map, authentication, assertion method elements, or fields, and those are all verification method maps. And a what is a verification method map? A verification method map is an ID, a controller, a type, uh, a public key, multi-base string, and a JSON key map. JSON key map is, is defined higher up in this file. We can see that a service is defined as a list of service maps. And so we're familiar with those being service endpoints. So it's an ID, it's a type, a string of types and then a string of service endpoints. So um, the foundation distribution has some cool. So there we are with Freddie again. Ask Freddie at, at Freddie Architect on Twitter. Okay, so let's look at layer one. So we think of what we've seen so far in layer zero, we have the ability of uh, any two pieces of software to, to for one to send a message to the other, assuming that the sender knows either the URL and port, or it knows the numerical IP address and port of the receiver. Um, so in this scenario, we're doing one small additive change. It's still REST over HTTP, but we're introducing a did, did addressability. So in this case, Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Alice the person wants to send a message to Bob the person. Alice has a did, did colon person colon one, two, three, four. Bob has a did, did colon person colon five, six, seven, eight. Can Alice send a message to Bob using that information? The answer is no. 
Um, the primary reason is because we're really talking about pieces of software communicating with each other. So the answer is no. What we need to introduce is the concept of the service, the software agents. These are REST over HTTP agents. They're not DIDCOM agents yet. We'll get to DIDCOM agents in a moment. And we want Alice's agent to be able to send a message to Bob's agent. Can we do that with what we know so far? The answer is still no. Alice's software agent needs to know the URL or the IP address and port of Bob's agent. At this point, Alice's personification only knows, only knows that Bob has a did and that Bob's did is did colon person colon five, six, seven, eight. So we need something that will map that did down to a service endpoint. We need something uh, that will take did colon person colon five, six, seven, eight and map it to HTTP colon slash slash example dot com colon eighty eighty or down level even farther to ninety three one eighty four two sixteen thirty four colon eighty eighty. How do we do that? How do we enable Alice's client to send a message to Bob's agent? Well, the way to do that is using the did registry and using did resolution protocols. So the way Alice sends a message to Bob is Alice will take um, Bob's did the five six seven eight did colon person colon five six seven eight send it into the did registry the did registry will respond uh, with a did document and that did document will be these URLs and so after Alice's client has received those URLs uh, Alice's client um, can create an instance of an HTTP client invoke an HTTP put uh, to put a message uh, to this URL. Agents don't deal directly with DIDs. Agents, just like domain names need to be mapped into IP address, at my, at IP addresses, uh, agents need to take DIDs and map them into service endpoint addresses, and then service endpoint addresses need to be mapped into IP addresses. So, when we talk about service endpoint resolution here, um, the, the two main additions, if you will, relative to layer zero are, we need to use the did registry to resolve the did to the association to did, associated did document. And we, then we need to extract the service endpoint URL from the did document that's returned. Uh, once we have that, then we can use that service endpoint URL, either resolving it to a local host file or a DNS server uh, to find the IP address. Here's an example of a did, call, uh, did document. So this is the did document actually for did colon person 5678. So this is uh, Bob's uh, did document. And we see some stuff in here. But down here, we can see that there's a service endpoint for the REST agent uh, type. And... Um, example colon uh, example dot com dot 8085 this is actually incorrect that should be 8080 to be consistent with our previous um, with our previous slide but this is an example of a um, let's look at some different scenarios suppose Alice wants to interact with her bank well Alice has a did the bank has a did Alice has a software agent Thrift Bank has a software agent. Uh, ABC Grocery uh, wants to order cabbages from David's Cabbages. David's a farmer. Similar, similar thing um, where they each have dids. In this case, this is a third scenario where Alice is trying to order uh, produce or cabbages from David as well. So each has a did. Um, a respective did and each has an agent and the way that um, Alice's agent or ABC Groceries agent is able to uh, place an order uh, with David is by uh, taking David's did the did colon 
org colon zero zero one zero zero two zero zero three, resolving it to a URL and port, and um, then doing an HTTP put uh, to pass that message to the software agent. This section, again, Freddie's available if you have any questions. Layer two. So layer introduce, introduces a single concept, the single concept of DIDCOM messaging or DIDCOM messages. And it differs uh, only in the fact that DIDCOM messaging supersedes the use of plain old REST over HTTP. So here again is the simple example. Uh, we have a client on the right who wants to send a DIDCOM message uh, over to the DIDCOM agent. What's special about DIDCOM agents? They are authenticated encrypted. That means that prior to being sent, on the right-hand side there, there's a box called outbound processing. What outbound processing does is uh, encrypts the message using the receiver's keys. And part of that encryption uh, the clients, um, the clients uh, decentralized identifier is in, included in that encrypted message so that when the agent receives it and decrypts the message using inbound processing, it is able not only to extract the contents of the message, but also to verify uh, who the receiver was. So DIDCOM messages, because of the way that the authenticated encryption occurs, can only be decrypted by the receiver. And once the receiver decrypts it, it's able to authenticate and assure uh, him or her uh, who the sender was. That's the simple mechanism here. And so the only thing we're adding in layer two relative to the layer one uh, did addressable model is we're adding the ability to uh, uh, encrypt uh, authenticated encryption and then decryption and authentication. So if we look at a specific scenario where ABC Grocery wants to send a purchase order for 10 cabbages, we're gonna assume that, that there's a way of encoding that purchase order in the DIDCOM message. We can see that ABC Grocery um, has a did and David's Cabbages has a did, did colon org colon 111222333. And we have to figure out then, how does ABC Grocery uh, get the service endpoint uh, for David's? Of course, it's just like layer one. It's what we learned in layer one. We're going to take that did colon org colon 111222333, pass it into the did registry. Uh, ABC Grocery is going to get the did document back. Out of the did document, it's going to pull out the service endpoint, which is uh, HTTP colon example, HTTP slash slash example dot com colon 8090 this time. And, um, and then ABC Grocery is going to use, um, use that URL create an HTTP client, do an HTTP put to send that in authenticated and encrypted message over to the agent. Where does that authenticated encryption occur? It occurs in the purple box called outbound processing on the origin interface. And when David's Cabbage's agent receives it, it's going to decrypt the message. Uh, using its private key and being able to authenticate that uh, now, in fact, was ABC Grocery uh, that sent it to, to him or her. That's kind of a description of the core protocol. And so DIDCOM messages are able to transmit any kind of data. But what is more is to build on top of that, to build application specific protocols, custom DIDCOM protocols. And this is a list from Daniel Hardman. Uh, of, of uh, some scenarios uh, where DIDCOM could be used. In addition to creating the application specific protocols, you could imagine different fields and values and that sort of thing. Uh, in those messages, you could also have attachments. So again, any questions, um, any questions can be sent to, uh, to Freddie. So here's a pop quiz. What are we? What is? What does this picture symbolize? 
we've already talked about didcom agents we've talked a little bit about didcom user agents we haven't really got to the layer where we've done a drill down on those we've talked about the didcom always on appliance so this symbolizes a didcom user agent this is a didcom agent that has a user interface a user experience that allows humans and frogs uh, to interact with the didcom uh, the didcom network Okay, so here's where we're talking more formally about um, attachments. Um, atta uh, DIDCOM agent attachments. And so the scenario here, um, ABC Groceries wants to send a purchase order for 10 cabbages to David's Cabbages. And, and how do we enact that? Well, The first thing ABC Grocery does is it needs to get the service point service endpoint URL for David's Cabbage's agent. So it's going to take the the did for David's Cabbage's the did colon org colon one 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 two 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 three three three, pass it into the dead registry, get the did document back, and extract from that did document the service endpoint URL and port or the IP address and port whatever comes back in the did document. This is exactly what we've seen in layers 0, 1, and 2. No different. The only thing we're doing this time is when we create the message, before we do the outbound processing, in the process of creating the message, we're going to uh, attach a, a purchase order. We're going to attach a verifiable credential purchase order. The document there you see with the lock on it is the didcom notation for uh, a verifiable credential and we're going to attach that to the message and that's where we're going to encode the order for the 10 cabbages other than that it's exactly the same that we've seen in in level two where we created a didcom message using outbound processing uh, it's exactly the same as level one where we did uh, did addressability um, and it's in the, at the end it's really just a rest over HTTP call like we saw in level zero discussed before you know here's some 20 different uh, didcom message attachments that have been uh, have been added to the didcom notation um, mdls nfts licenses other you know other kinds of drivers licenses office documents web pages zip files uh, multimedia files uh, and the note uh, from before that, you know, very large attachments and multimedia blobs, et cetera, should be stored in cloud storage and, and represented as a linked attachment in the did, didcom message. So this is an explanation then, uh, I believe we're up to layer two, and all we've done, um, uh, actually layer three, I guess, all we've done is take what we've learned in layers zero, one, and two, um, to create didcom messages and we've added the ability to uh, have attachments again just a little bit of the kind of side commentary that's introduced in this level <coughs> is the idea of the authentic conversation spectrum so does it make sense and i used to be a huge proponent of saying that you could encode anything on the planet anything in the universe as a verifiable credential i don't believe that anymore I believe that the only thing you should be encoding in verifiable credentials are things that are true, things that are facts, things that are normative statements. And that's what you see represented on the left in blue. On the right hand side is didcom messages. You can basically represent all the data that you put in a verifiable credential. You could represent it as a custom didcom message, a custom didcom protocol. What would you put in didcom messages? I would suggest that you put non-normative statements there, are things that represent opinions and folklore uh, on the extreme. In the middle, though, we might have a mixture of normative and non-normative statements. We, um, a, a normative statement, a fact or a truth might be a business document, an invoice, a purchase order, a way bill a delivery confirmation but you might not want to wrap that with some some additional information so that's where a didcom message with a verifiable credential attachment would make sense or a didcom message with a 
MDL driver's license attachment. Uh, if you're trying, if a, if Alice is trying to converse with the you know California Motor Vehicles branch, so there's a spectrum here for authentic conversations. So the truly authentic conversations are those that use verifiable credentials and normative statements about facts and truths, and um, uh, you know, the other end of the spectrum is uh, non-normative statements, opinions, and folklore. To help you understand a little bit more, I have a blog on uh, hyperonomy.com called Facts, Opinions, and Folklore, a preliminary taxonomy where I talk about facts, perturbations of facts, opinions, and folklore, and you can kind of read through that. If you have contributions to that, let me know. Uh, you could similar text uh, Freddie Architect uh, on Twitter and we'll, we'll pick that up. Um, a companion article to the Facts, Opinions and Folklore Preliminary Taxonomy article is the Truth and Marketplace Ideas article which talks about through precedent, legal precedent, historical precedent, constitutional precedent, um, how facts or opinions um, actually can be come truths or how do you judge them to be true and it's the idea of a marketplace of ideas so this is way outside the technical explanation of what web 7.0 is but i think it's uh, it's interesting reading okay so that's the end of uh layer three all we've done is take layer two the ability to send a didcom message from one client or one agent to another agent um, and we've had the ability to, uh, to add an attachment um, to that agent or to that message being sent to that agent. Freddie's waiting for your questions if you have any. Layer four, we've only got uh, this and two more layers to go through. So really the white paper should have stopped at layer three. It gave you everything you needed to know for doing point-to-point -point messaging, point-to-point -point communications between two agents using DIDCOM. But then somebody asked me a question on LinkedIn asking if I could extend or how would I extend the model, the DIDCOM architecture reference model, to support lib P2P, which is a mesh, mesh networking type of transport. And um, I thought about that for half a second. I mean, on this far, I had this model here where I could do point to point and I could have attachments and uh, and that was all very cool. And then as I thought about how to create mesh network topology type things, uh, it became clear, um, this model became clear. So it's the same DIDCOM notation architecture diagrams we've seen before, but it, now the messages are routed through a network, the DIDCOM network. And the DIDCOM network is a global message relay and delivery network. Um, in, in the HTTP version of the network, these are actually DIDCOM network router nodes. They're actually implemented just as specialized DIDCOM agents. And in this case, the client forwards a message to its nearest DIDCOM network router node. And there's intelligent routing and routing tables and adjacency and adjacency cost metrics and all of that uh, known to those router nodes. And it figures out the best way, the fastest way to deliver that message uh, to the DIDCOM agent on the left. So this took layer three, which is about point to point, did call messaging with attachments and extending it to being able to route, intelligently route messages over arbitrary mesh networks. How does a node like node number three know who its nearest nodes are? <coughs> and how does two know what its nearest nodes are? How does node one know where its nearest well, that's just information in the DID document for each router agent. So down here in the bottom, lines 19 to 27, um, normally you're familiar with uh, a DID document providing service endpoints, you know, specifically for that, that particular 
subject, that particular person, that particular organization. But there's no reason why you can't use the DID document to point to your nearest neighbors. Now, in this particular mock-up, I used service endpoint URLs to show that node 1, uh, noted at the top of this DID document, is connected to node 3, node 5, and node 9. I wished I would have done a slightly different version where down in lines 23 to 25, I would have used the DIDs, the decentralized identifiers for those nodes, so that node 1 could not only know the service endpoints for its nearest neighbors, but actually know who its nearest neighbors are, it could query the DID documents for the nearest neighbors and build a routing table for the entire uh, for the entire network or for the part of the network that it needs to know. If you're a little bit familiar like with Cisco routers and TCP IP routing on the internet, it's the same thing. We're just doing the routing, intelligent routing of DID call messages uh, over routing tables maintained by a group of specialized DIDCOM agents. What does the minimum viable DIDCOM network like for a developer look like? Well, it's a single node. A sing and in DIDCOM notation, DIDCOM terminology, we call that uh, a mediator node, <coughs> sometimes called a relay node. Uh, in Web 7.0, it's called a router node. And so it has the ability to cache uh, did call messages, do intelligent routing, forwarding from node to node to node if we had multiple nodes. But in this case, we're just using it as a cache or a relay um, between uh, ABC Grocery and David's Cabbages. The heading changed, but the diagram is exactly the same. It also supports what we call the disconnected agent scenario. So in the disconnected agent scenario, uh, there's two sub scenarios. One is when the receiving agent isn't online, so you can't send a point to point message. So what you do is you just forward it to the nearest active live mediator node. And that intelligent routing in the network will route that message to the nearest neighbor of that DIDCOM agent. So that when that DIDCOM agent comes alive, first thing it's going to do is check who its router, nearest router agent is <coughs> and do an inquiry and an HTTP download of those messages. Again, the only DIDCOM agent that can decrypt and authenticate a particular DIDCOM message is the one that it was intended for, the intended receiver. So the fact that these messages are cached or stored in the network uh, does not change the security or privacy considerations guaranteed by DINCOM messaging. The other scenario, uh, other disconnected agent scenario, is uh, <coughs> when the agent on the left is hidden behind a firewall. So clearly the agent on the right can't do an HTTP put uh, to the agent on the left if the latter is behind a firewall. So this is the um, <coughs> way this is handled, the client would post the message to uh, the network and then the agent once it, the agent from time to time would periodically pull the network to see if there's any messages uh, waiting for it. This isn't brand new, this isn't rocket science. 20 years ago, a fellow named Riazzi and his uh, company, his team designed a product called Groove Workspace. Company is called Groove Networks, and uh, it was built exactly on this architecture. Microsoft ultimately bought that product for 20 million bucks. Uh, they bought, effectively, bought Ray Ossie and his team as well. Uh, Ray uh, succeeded Bill Gates as the chief software architect at Microsoft. So here's layer four. Um, it's about the addition of the mesh network, and we've spent a little bit of time talking about the degenerate or, or minimum viable. Uh, same as before, send a, a tweet to at Freddy um, Architect on Twitter. Okay, so we've worked our way through the first uh, four layers, five layers. We have two left, layers five and layers six. Uh, let's 
that they're all about. So layer five, we've actually talked about already. It's the concept of the user agent being a model. So there in DidCom notation, that's what a DidCom user agent looks like. It has an origin interface on the left, <coughs> the arrow. It has a service endpoint, the ball on the right. And so it can obviously communicate with other everyday DidCom agents. It can send out uh, queries or messages using the origin interface on the left, and it can receive uh, information uh, from other DIDCOM agents uh, using the service endpoint on the right. Um, and those will be authenticated encrypted uh, DIDCOM messages. It's just ordinary DIDCOM messaging. So for example, if this was a chat application, whenever the person typed in a message and clicked send, uh, that would go out on that left origin interface to all the members, uh, all the agents that are part of the uh, group collaboration. And um, when other messages are coming in, uh, they would be received on the right uh, service endpoint interface. <coughs> so this is a little bit more than a mock-up. This is a live running application, uh, chat application that can send out like text messages, but files. And uh, it's an open source project on GitHub. And uh, as it exists, it runs on the, the Tor network, the dark, uh, the dark web uh, mesh network protocol. And so as a reference application, this will be adapted to run on top of uh, Web 7.0. When Microsoft first released .NET to prove that you could build any kind of application with .NET, they uh, created a mock-up of Microsoft Outlook and gave it away as open source. So uh, using this fully functional, fully active user experience representing Outlook, you could create an email client that runs on top of Web 7.0 and uses DIDCOM messaging instead of a uh, STTP, STMP, SMTP. So that's another reference application that will eventually be built. Um, in part one, I spent quite a bit of time talking about the Windows printer driver scenario, and it's really about eliminating facts between Carol cardiologists' uh, records. Facts is a protocol between Carol cardiologists' desktop application, medical records desktop applications on the right, and the general physician's um, office uh, on the left. And uh, how do those um, doctor's notes get transmitted without using fax and using didcom and didcom agents. Um, pop quiz, what do these red boxes represent? Well, those didcom agents, the one that runs, represents Carol the cardiologist, and the one that represents the general physician in, in his or her office, those could be running on just a local PC, tablet, phone. Um, Carol's DIDCOM agent could be running on the, you know, the PC over here on the right hand side. <coughs> but this is, uh, the red boxes represent where these agents could be running on the web 7.0, always on DIDCOM agent. That is the web 7.0 DIDCOM agent hardware appliance. And the reason why I bring that up is if we think of the user agent in the top left, the top of that blue box, that user agent would be running on the general physician's phone. That user agent would be paired with the physician's DIDCOM agent running on her always on uh, DIDCOM agent appliance in her office. But the phone she can use anywhere on the planet. So it's, this is really about as simple as an application, as simple of a diagram, as simple as a scenario that represents this unified hardware and software ecosystem represents, that uh, is represented by Web 7.0. That was a simple application, but we also want to build globally scoped, globally scaled applications. So how about creating a unified centralized solution whose scope includes global air traffic control 
aircraft crew scheduling, baggage handling and tracking, passenger tracking, seating and credentialing, food and beverage service, everything to do with the industry of commercial aircraft. Every control tower, every airport, every run right, potentially every light on every runway could be represented by a verifiable credential. Most of those entities would also have their own DIDCOM agent, their own trusted personal agent to represent them and to respond <coughs> to incoming information. Every aircraft would have a trusted personal agent running on it. All the baggage handling equipment would have a trusted personal agent on it. It's getting to the point where every suitcase has an air tag on it, which is effectively a trusted personal agent of, of one sort or another. Passenger ticketing, every passenger would have their own trusted personal agent. Um, the ticketing systems, every system within an airline would have, be a, a mesh, a network of DIDCOM agents, trusted personal agents, food and beverage service. The trolleys themselves might have trusted personal agents running on them, uh, always on uh, DIDCOM agents running on them. So there, we're talking about billions. If there's 8 billion people in the world, let's say an eighth of them fly, we're talking billions of entities and billions of DIDCOM agents. It all comes back to this picture. Pretty simple. The DIDCOM agent, <coughs> just to wrap up this particular uh, discussion of this particular, a, this particular layer, the DIDCOM agent exposes a user interface, a user experience, and this is how humans and frogs interact with the DIDCOM network. Okay, the last layer is coming up. Pop quiz, why is this picture of Fred relevant to the previous layer? Because the previous layer is the combination of layers zero, one, two, three, four, and five, six layers. If you count carefully, there's six layers in that hamburger. Okay, layer six, the culmination of Web 7.0, the Web 7.0 DIDCOM agent architecture model. <coughs> Again, I've talked on and off about the Groove Workspace platform. This is a diagram from back in the day, 20 years ago. This is showing gateways connected to Groove Workspace, clients running on laptops and computers and that we have disconnected copies of groups workspace running disconnected or copies of groove workspace that maybe aren't connected to the network and they can't uh, do direct connections with you know the other people that are in those collaboration groups uh, they may live behind a firewall symbolized by these black bars and so there's the concept of the Groove Relay server, these routing agents <coughs> that are capable of caching um, did call messages. And uh, if you look at this, you can see a lot of similarities between that we now have in Web 7.0. Well, not sure, actually, I don't remember if I've talked about this slide already, but this is the, the elevator pitch. This is what Web 7.0 is. It's a unified software and hardware ecosystem. It's more than just a platform. It's a unified software and hardware ecosystem for building resilient, trusted, decentralized systems using decentralized identifiers, DIDCOM agents, and verifiable credentials. And the important buzz line here is take what you need and leave the rest. When we're, we're putting Web 7.0 together and we looked at everything that everybody's doing, we use the mantra, take what we need, and leave the rest. We don't have to support everything. Similarly, when you're building 
globally scoped and scalable solutions on top of Web.7, take the same advice. Take what you need and leave the rest. You don't have to use everything in, in Web 7.0, just the same way that Web 7.0 doesn't uh, unify every possible decentralized standard on the planet. Why is it a unified software and hardware system? Because we have the Web 7.0 always on DIDCOM agent. It's a DIDCOM agent device that is paired with your trusted personal agent running on your phone. The reference hardware is a Snapdragon uh, Generation 3 ARM processor with 512 gigabytes of SSD and 32 gigabytes of DDR. This device can be bought as a developer platform for 599 US dollars. Clearly, um, in the fullness of time, we'd want a device that's probably sub $200 or $100. I can easily imagine that every cell phone company on the planet wants to be able to sell you one of these. You can imagine that Google and Apple and uh, Samsung are going to make, uh, make these available to you. So that's the description of the last layer. That's the description of layer six, which is the full realization of Web 7.0. Directions. <clears throat> Future directions are largely ill-determined at this point. I mean, there's lots to do with Web 7.0. Uh, specifically support for additional uh, DIDCOM uh, network stacks, the Bluetooth stack. Uh, Web 7.0 will leverage the work that people are already doing to uh, support Bluetooth as a transport, libp 2 p as a transport. Excuse me, uh, etc. So other transports, um, other large application scenarios. One thing that, when you start looking at all this, it begins to suggest we're building an operating system, a decentralized operating system, um, a decentralized operating system based on DIDs and DIDCOM messages, DIDCOM agents. And this is where things kind of become interesting. Look at sort of the history of operating systems. And this is a little bit of a play on words, but if, if you really look at what's been happening with operating systems that are based on message passing and message routing. If you go back to 1979, there's a thaw real-time message passing operating system. Uh, created by David Cheriton while he was a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, my alma mater. Um, the successor to Thoth is the Harmony operating system and this concept um, documented by Dr. Kelly Booth called anthropomorphic programming. You look at the very first public version of Windows that I was able to use, Windows 0.8. 9.8, uh, 9.8.9, um, and inside there's the asynchronous message loop. Um, Windows itself is entirely message based. You look at, you know, ahead to 2001, the Groove Workspace um, platform that I've talked about over and over again. I think we're at a stage where we're talking about what I'm calling the Web 7.0 DID DIDCOM operating system. And I like the acronym DIDDOS. And um, so when we look at the idea of the Web 7.0 um, reference specification and foundation distribution, it's really about the, the reference distribution is about creating reference distributions of the DDoS operating system. And we've already talked about uh, the versions and the distributions and that. The, uh, to fully fulfill uh, what's happening here, we have the Web 3 or 7.0 uh, Book of Knowledge. It's actually at 11 volumes. I'm 
and looking for writers to help complete uh, the writing of these of this web 7.0. So any final questions can be sent to uh, architect. And quickly to conclude, one last repetition. Uh, Web 7.0 is a unified software and hardware ecosystem for building resilient, trusted, decentralized systems using decentralized identifiers, DIDCOM agents, and verifiable credentials. Take what you need and leave the rest. Just a note on, as I've mentioned already, take what you need and leave the rest. So Web 7.0 took what it needs from the existing specifications effort and left the rest. For example, nowhere in Web 7 do you see reference to wallet technologies and APIs. Those were left behind um, uh, in Web 2.0 and 3.0. And when you're building your own globally scalable and scoped applications, when you're building resilient, trustable, decentralized applications, take what you need from Web 7 and leave the rest of it behind. For example, use MDLs. Uh, and maybe not verifiable credentials. Use whatever makes sense for yourself. And again, I'm here, I'm crediting or acknowledging the work of uh, Pastor uh, Hardman and the uh, uh, Grand. Uh, uh, we could talk a little bit about techn technology adoption models. Uh, those are described in my blog. Uh, I find it particularly interesting is a social evolution model of wanderers becoming parties of explorers, creating family units, communities, and societies. I think that's what we're actually trying to do or what, de facto what's really happening. Um, if you're familiar with the classic technology adoption model, uh, we're in the left, far left of this uh, innovation cycle. Uh, but this is the technology adoption model I cherish the most, uh, Model 3, in the uh, comprehensive uh, technology adoption model blog on my Hyperonomy website. Um, it's based on an article from Harvard Business Review, and I'll defer to the, to the blog article for you to, to read that. So the next steps. So we're building code for all of those diagrams that I showed you, live running code, a live running did registry uh, that is front-ended by a live running did registry gateway. Um, there will be code, client and agent code that illustrates every level of the seven levels in the web 7.0 model. Oh, lastly, here's a call to action. Uh, based on the uh, grand unifying theory of uh, Dr. Hardman, and it's targeted to Toip and, and people like Drummond. Uh, consider replacing the three-party issuer holder verifier model. Uh, consider replacing it with the two-party credential sender receiver model and replace it everywhere. Replace it in the Toip four-layer model, replace it in the verifiable credential uh, data model specification. The three-party issuer holder verifier model is a very biased application specific model. And as we've shown here, the only thing we need to support, the minimum we need to support in a technical specification like the verifiable credential data model is the credential sender receiver model. On the right, the sender creates credentials, signs credentials, and sends them. On the left, the receiver receives the credential, verifies the credential, and processes the credential. That's all we need to do. We don't need anything more complicated. The, the um, three-party issuer holder verifier model could be removed to a technical node or, or W3C. That's it. Uh, thank you very much. Seems to be my standard time length here, but an hour and 25 minutes. Uh, this is the last slide. And again, uh, thank you for watching, for those of you that made it to the end. And feel free to ask Freddie uh, if you have any questions. Bye for now.